Hey Econ students, this is Jacob Clifford. Now if you clicked on this video, you've probably already learned about GDP, what's included and not included, unemployment, inflation, and business cycles. Now here in unit three, we're gonna jump into the graphing of macroeconomics, so it's time to show you this. Getting that very first row done for a Rubik's Cube is actually really easy. That's just like the production possibilities curve that you learned back in unit one. But that's not all, you still have five other sides to solve and they're a lot harder, just like the other five graphs of macroeconomics. So in addition to the production possibilities curve, you're also gonna have to learn aggregate demand and supply, the Phillips curve, the money market graph, loanable funds, and foreign exchange. And the way you learn how to draw the graphs is the same way that you learn how to solve a Rubik's Cube. You sit down, you watch a YouTube video, and you practice. If you don't practice, there's no way you're gonna be able to solve one of these. Watching the video alone is not enough. Right now, these look super complicated, but if you know the procedures and know what you're doing, and if you practice, you're gonna be able to draw and shift them perfectly every single time. By far, the most important graph in a macroeconomics class is aggregate demand and aggregate supply. Aggregate means add it all together. So the aggregate demand curve is just all the different demand curves or all the different goods and services in the economy add it all together. But since we're talking about cars and bread and toothpaste, we can't put price on the y-axis. Instead, we're gonna put price level. And down here on the x-axis, we can't put quantity because we're looking at all the goods and services in the economy, and that is the real GDP. So here it is, this is the demand for everything in the entire economy. There's three reasons why the aggregate demand curve is downward sloping. The first one is the real wealth effect. When price level falls, then the assets of consumers have more purchasing power, so those consumers buy more stuff. Your real wealth goes up when prices fall. But when price level goes up and there's more inflation, then purchasing power falls for your assets and you buy less goods and services. Inflation erodes your purchasing power and gives you less real wealth. A million dollars isn't exactly a lot of money these days. The second reason why aggregate demand is downward sloping is the interest rate effect. When price level goes up, people buy less, but they also save less, which means less money in banks and less money to be lent out to borrowers. This results in higher interest rates and less investment spending, so there's a decrease in the quantity of goods and services demanded. And this goes the other direction as well. If price levels fall, then people are gonna spend more, but they're also gonna save more. That means there's more money in banks to be lent out to borrowers, so that lowers the interest rates and increases investment and the quantity demanded. It's free real estate. The last reason why this is downward sloping is the exchange rate effect. When prices increase in one country, other countries don't want to buy those higher priced goods, so they'll go buy from a different country instead, so the quantity demanded is going to fall. And when price level falls, this country is going to export more goods and services because other countries want to buy more of our stuff. So there it is, three reasons why the aggregate demand is downward sloping. The real wealth effect accounts for the behavior of consumers, the interest rate effect accounts for the behavior of borrowers or investors or businesses, and the exchange rate effect accounts for the behavior of people in other countries countries. Each of these show you that there's an inverse relationship between price level and the GDP demanded. Does that make sense? Kinda. Kinda? Oh, that's good then. Okay, just like a market demand curve, an aggregate demand curve can shift. An increase is to the right, a decrease is to the left. And the good news is you already know the shifters. Anything that affects consumer spending, investment spending, government spending, or net exports is gonna shift the aggregate demand curve. Honestly, the best way to help you learn this is to have you practice. So here are six scenarios. Your job is to figure out what's gonna happen to aggregate demand for the United States. Will it increase or decrease and what's the shifter? So right now, pause this video and see if you know what's gonna happen to aggregate demand for each one of these situations. It's graphing time! I started with an easy one. A boom in the stock market is gonna increase aggregate demand because that's gonna increase consumer spending. And the widespread fear of a recession would decrease consumer confidence, decrease consumer spending, and decrease aggregate demand. Those ones were pretty easy, but this third one, that's a little trickier. Remember that transfer payments are payments by the government to individuals for like Social Security or unemployment. And this will increase aggregate demand, but this is not government spending. Remember, transfer payments does not count in GDP. Wait, I'm confused. If this was government spending on the military or infrastructure like roads and bridges, then yes, it would be government spending and it would increase aggregate demand. But transfer payments don't count in GDP, and so we don't count it as government spending. But it does still increase aggregate demand. This is because people are gonna spend that money they get from the government. So if your grandma gets a check, that doesn't count in GDP, but when she spends that money, that does count in GDP. Now, even if you got this wrong and put that as government spending and made a mistake, that's okay. Just understand the idea that it's gonna increase aggregate demand. That's more important. And situation number four, if the US dollar appreciates the aggregate demand in the United States, 
is gonna go down. I'm gonna cover everything you need to know about foreign exchange in unit six, but for now, understand if the currency appreciates, it's more expensive for foreigners, so exports are gonna fall and imports are gonna increase. That means aggregate demand in the United States is gonna decrease. And in number five, if the real interest rate falls, that makes it easier for borrowers to borrow money. It's cheaper to take out loans, so investment spending is gonna increase. And so will consumer spending, but only on interest-sensitive consumer goods. These are durable goods that people take out loans to buy, like cars. So when interest rates fall, businesses are gonna borrow more, that increases investment spending. Consumers are gonna buy more cars, that's gonna increase consumer spending, and that's gonna increase aggregate demand. And the last one, if there's a significant increase in income taxes, that means people have less money less disposable income, they're gonna spend less, decrease consumer spending, and decrease aggregate demand. One of the things you gotta watch out for when you're shifting aggregate demand and aggregate supply is only do one shift at a time. What I mean by that is like on this last one, if you see there's an increase in taxes, you might assume, okay, that means there's more tax revenue and that's gonna be an increase in government spending. And so aggregate demand is gonna increase. Although that's logical and that might happen, that's not the very first thing that's gonna happen, the very first shift that occurs. The questions your teacher or professor are gonna give you have only one right answer, one shift that occurred. Don't bring in outside other things that could happen. I know that's gonna frustrate some of you and that's why I'm going back to this. A Rubik's Cube, when you make a move, you're changing other things. You've gotta make sure only do one move at a time for an econ class because the world is just way too complex and you're gonna get totally lost Shoot. I'm gonna add this Rubik's Cube to my wall to help you remember that the graphs of macroeconomics are an oversimplification of life because the real world is just way too complex. But don't go anywhere, there's still two things we have to do. The first one, if you like my videos, they're helping you learn and love economics, please subscribe and let me know in the comments what you thought of this video and how you did on those shifters. And be sure to take a look at my ultimate review pack. It's totally gonna help you learn and ace your class or your exams or the AP test. And the second thing we gotta do, it's time for a pop quiz. <gasps> No! At the end of these videos, I give you a few practice multiple choice questions. So do the questions and look in the comments below for the answer key. As always, thank you so much for watching my videos. Until next time.